verse 53 is where we pick our subject. Listen to what they say now. They say over that idea that never see death. They say in verse 53, surely you are not greater than our father Abraham who died. The prophets died too. Whom do you make yourself out to be? That's where my title come from. Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? Well, he's going to tell them who he thinks he is. Uh, they think he's a Samaritan demon possessed. Uh, 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 they think that he's off his rocker. And listen, if he is not what he says he is, he is all that. Because he's made some outrageous claims. And listen, he's about to even make bigger ones. He's about to even make bigger ones. Jesus answered, and he's going to give them three identities. Jesus said, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. Now here's what he, what he means by that. If God glorifies me and you say you're a follower of God, then you should be glorifying me. Does that sound his logic? All right. Verse, verse 55. You have not come to know me, but I know him. If I say that I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham, watch this now. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. The Jews responded, you're not 50 years old. And you've seen Abraham? You know, they misquoted him again. They misquoted him again. Jesus said to them, and that's going to be my subject next week. Truly, truly, I say to you, before Ab Abraham was born, I am. And boy, did they understand what he just said? Because in verse 59, they picked up stones. I mean, the argument, the arguing was over. <laughs> And what were they going to do with those stones? They was going to build a little house for him, put his name on it, right? <laughs> huh? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, right. Let's have a word of prayer. We're going to talk about who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? You know, you have no idea how relevant that subject is to your life tonight or today. Who do you think you are? Because people are always challenging us because of our faith that way. Who do you think you are? And here's what's important is to know who you are in the Lord. Because people are always going to challenge your faith. Always challenge what you to believe to be true. What's important is that you know it to be true. And upon that rock, I can stand my ground, right? Because people are going to call you names. They're going to challenge your faith. You need to know who you are. So when they say, who do you think you are? You can say, are you really interested? Because <laughs> I can tell you who I am in the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful today. Pray the Lord would be able to speak to our hearts through the ministry of the word of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. That you would teach us great things today. I mean, sometimes when I have those days, I read passages like this and I go like, you know what? <laughs> my day is not that bad. On my worst day in the ministry, I've never had anybody call me names like that nor pick up stones to kill me. So. Do we know who we are? Are we really confident within our own fiber of our faith? Are we confident who we are in the Lord? 
for we're challenged on it every day. So I pray today, Father, you would encourage our hearts with this message in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, these there's one thing about these apostate religious leaders. They're relentless. <laughs> I mean, not only did they hate his message, they hated the messenger. When they couldn't silence the message, then it was to silence the messenger. And so it is with the world. That's how the church has become martyred. It's the way it is in many places of the world today. First, they challenge your message. Know this, that when they don't win, they're going to challenge the messenger. We started this chapter with them challenging him legally. They wanted, to, wanted the courts to do their dirty work. And so the chapter opens with the woman caught in adultery set up by this group uh, to drag him into court, run him through the muck and the mill. And if, if everything worked on their order, the courts would kill him or, or do something with him because they couldn't do anything with him. So they've, they've tried to silence the message. They've challenged, challenged, challenged. The rhetorical questions in this chapter are unbelievable. We'll talk about it this morning. Nine times they used rhetorical questions. Not seeking the truth, because sometimes rhetorical questions are just ways of trying to get to the truth. They weren't trying to get to the truth. They were trying to destroy the messenger. They used the rhetorical mechanism nine times in this chapter. It's well worth a special study when you go in there and look at the questions. Those question marks. Out of what he has previously told them, they are now convinced that he, surely you are not greater than our father Abraham who died. When they get through this conversation, he says, of course I am. Of course I am, but he doesn't say it that way, does he? Because he's not argumentative. This is not flesh versus flesh. That's the way most of us fight. He draws the sword on them just as he did the devil in Matthew 4. He drew the sword. Listen, you want to listen. Nothing wrong with fighting. Do it spiritually. Sometimes you can't prevent a fight. Sometimes you can't prevent it. They attack you. Boom, there it is. Now what you going to do? Listen to me. You can fight in the flesh or you can fight in the spirit. If you fight in the flesh, you've lost. That song is all about fighting the, fighting the, fighting the spiritual. Every war, every fight, every conflict is spiritual. At least as a, on your part, right? On your part, that's, that's very important. So they come back, surely, and, and they mean by that word, surely, meaning, of course, you would have to be nuts not to think this way. Of course, of course not. Surely you're not greater than our father Abraham. Of course not, of course not. See? Who died? Who do you make yourself out to be? Who do you think you are? Jesus will identify, in, before this chapter is over, Jesus will identify who he is. He will begin by telling them three identities. He says, let me tell you who I am. And he's going to do it in 50 through, 54 and through 56. They're going to respond at verse 57. Jesus is going to counter with a truly, truly in verse 58. And they're going to pick up stones to kill him. On my worst day in the ministry, I've never had that. <laughs> On my worst day, I've had people walk up and challenge me. Had one guy tried to drag me out the church, out of the church. And I started going to the gym. <laughs> That's absolutely the truth. 
thank God for Mr. Dennis, because by the time I got middle down, I was way out in the flesh. <laughs> I was way out there. And so I learned, but listen, even that day wasn't this bad. I mean, this is, but this is kind of a normal day in the life of Christ. Can I tell you that? When I read this, uh, I thought, I thought to myself about this. There used to be an old saying over this. Who do you think you are? There used to be an old saying that says, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. You remember that? Let me tell you the Jews view of that. These apostate Jews views of that. If you can't stand the kitchen, kill the cook. <laughs> kill the cook. That's the way that guy. Now, listen, I ain't going out to dinner with them. They're not inviting me over. I'd have to have a, I had, to, I would have to bring a tester with me to test everything they serve me. These are bad, bad people who think they're really good. That's the, and they're not going to be convinced. They think Jesus is evil and they're good. And so there you have it. Let me tell you about a rhetorical question. Well, you hear us use it a great deal, especially it, it's used a lot in the scriptures, both by Paul and Jesus and other people. It's an apologetic method. And so you'll see guys doing what is called today apologetics. It's really just, it's really just fighting for your life. <laughs> trying to get, try to get through to one thing to another, but a rhetorical question, and you always pay attention to rhetorical questions because, listen, not everybody, listen, it's going to be one of two things, a rhetorical question. It's either going to be positive volition or negative volition driven. Because a rhetorical question ask, a rhetorical question is asked merely, it's just it's a simple thing, and it's a critic. It's a it's a system of critiquing something. And if it's if it's positive volition, they may ask you a lot of questions, a, a lot of things that really and what they're trying to do is get to um, some way to be a critic of your ideas and other ideas just to get to the truth. I used to be one of those guys. I mean, you, you, you know, you say, well, and I go like, yeah, well, what about this? And what about that? And what about this? And what about that? And what about this? And what about that? I guess that, I guess I'd be a verbal guy. Probably, probably all of us in the ministry are, don't you? <laughs> Either that or sermons are short. Well, I've got a picture. I'm going home. I don't know how that worked, but anyhow. So uh, let me give you an example of positive volition with rhetorical use. A woman at the well. She's a classic example of an unbeliever who uses rhetorical questions to get to the truth. She used it all over, uh, 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 often with Jesus. In verse 9, she says, how is, it, how is it that you being a Jew would ask me to drink, uh, to give you a drink since I'm a Samaritan woman? You know, I mean, Right. And listen, she's a little sassy, right? She's got a little spunk. She's a little sassy. Jesus doesn't even pay any attention to it. He doesn't pay any attention. Listen, let's just see where this is going to go. Let's just see where. And, and in verse 12, she says to him almost identically what they said, what they said to him. She said to him in verse 12, you are not greater than our father, Jacob, are you? See, the Samaritan's father was Jacob. And he doesn't go, not then he just smiles and, and sips on the drink. Because she, he understands she's really interested. He is hooked in on that. She's not pushing back. She's just trying to discover. And if you, if you talk long enough with them, with somebody, you will find out whether or not uh, they're really interested, just asking a lot of questions to try to get to some place, right? And in verse 42, if you followed that, in 
not now, but if you follow that in verse 42 of the fourth chapter, you will find that the city says to her, you remember she brings the whole city out, it is no longer what you said that makes me believe, but what I believe myself about this man called Jesus. See where she went? She went to conversion. See, she used rhetorical because that was a way that she dealt with stuff. She used it. Listen, we all do this stuff sometimes, especially as Al says, if you're a verbal guy, a, a verbal person, a gal in this case. A rhetorical, a rhetorical used in a negative way is in our lesson text. A lesson text is a classic example of negative volition asking questions to destroy the message or the messenger. They're not interested in the truth. He's told them truth after truth. He's documented it, backed it up with the word of God. They're not in, interested in any of that. This is, you know, and so you go like, okay. In John, the eighth chapter, verse six. Their intent was to legally accuse him to get him off the street preaching. In verse 37, the, the, Jesus said, you are seeking to kill me because I speak the truth of the word of God. In verses 40 and 41, they attacked him by claiming that, that they were not born of fornication, indicating that he was. In verse 59, the argument is over, and so they pick up stones. They are no longer interesting because they cannot refute the truth. They are going to kill the messenger. They're going to kill the messenger. When you read this chapter 8, verse 19, 22, 25, 34, 48, 53, 57, and then stones in the end. All rhetorical questions used by these people to trip him up, to trap him, to destroy his message. And in the end, they couldn't do it. So now they're going to destroy the messenger. Listen, this is the way Christianity is lived out in our real lives. That's the way people do it. Yeah. Now, in the South, they're more courteous. They are a little more courteous. They just leave. And then talk about you. They just leave. And then, and then talk about you. They don't talk to your face. They always talk to your back. Never talk to your face. I can tell you where I live, we were different in the north <laughs> than that. We were a little bit different than that. And we, we picked up stones quicker. <laughs> Point number two. The doctrinal principle learned from Job that we talk about around here a great deal applies to this in regard to this questioning of the Jews. False assumptions lead to false expectations, lead to false interpretations, lead to false application, and there you have it. And listen, when you get into that, you need to remember this because that's where you're headed. False assumptions lead to false expectation, interpretation, and application. We saw it over and over and over again in the book of, of Job. If you remember that, it became a principle. Here's what's going on in these guys' life. Second, they're religious. Second Corinthians 4.4. In whose case, the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving ones. That's how I get you. You can't get you in, um, unless you reject the truth. It blinds the minds of the unbelieving. This is who this group is. They are now blinded to the truth. They are blinded. They're like concrete, all mixed up and permanently set. There's no change in them. They're not, when you can't change them, then they're going to kill the messenger. That's political power so that they might not see. Listen to what he does. This is the devil. He tries to get him at a certain point so that he can pull him into blindness 
so that they cannot see the light of the, of the gospel, which is Christ, the image of God. Look at that. Look at that. So that, so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. See? These people have just crossed a, a, a really dangerous place in their life, haven't they? They have, and listen, now they're, as we say, a hell bent. Can I say that? Hell bent? The, the, to destroy him. They, they were on the ideas, and then they, listen, they had their meeting, Nicodemus. Uh, they shut him down because they said, listen, we need to take him out. We need to, Nicodemus said, listen, we've got to be law abiding. We're, we're a nation of laws. You ever heard that before? We're a nation of laws. And these laws have come from God. We're a nation of laws. Nicodemus stands up. Listen, they, they silenced him. They shut him down. He, that secret disciple of Christ. Just saying, you ought, we ought, listen, you need to do the right thing. But now, from chapter 8 on, there's not, not, nothing. Now, we're going to kill him. We're going to kill him one way or the other. We're going to kill him. We'd like to do it legally because... The, the Sanhedrin is divided. We are a law, we're a lawful people. We need to stay lawful. So they're going to work real hard, but they're going to kill him one way or the other. They're going to kill him. We want to do it legally. We want the government to do our dirty work. Uh, today we call that the swamp. We call it the swamp. In the 8th chapter of John, verse 53, surely you are not greater than our father who died, Abraham. <laughs> surely you're not greater. And they mean that. That's so far out there to believe that. And unless he's going to come back and he says, of course, and he, here's what he says. Here's how he operates. Here's how he thinks. When they ask a question, listen to me what, how he thinks. He thinks. Here's, his, here's Jesus' is, is, um, visual. Al. Here's what he, they ask, okay, here's what he thinks. Here's what he thinks. What's the, what's the word of God say? That's how he thinks. If you've watched him operate, that's exactly how he thinks. It don't matter. It don't matter if it's somebody wanting something good or trying to kill him. It does not matter what their motive is. He does not care what their motive is at this point. You know how it is? He deals with, what's, what's the word of God say? He, has, he, he, puts his, he puts his mind on things above and not on things below. He immediately, that's where he puts himself. Not whether, he can't put anybody else there, but he can put himself there. Boom, right there I am. Well, let's see, what's the, what does the Father say? Can we not, listen, can we just set our standard with him? I mean, this is what he wants from us. This is how this is how you win one for him. What does the Bible say? Represent it. Repre you don't have to defend it, but you do have to represent it. L listen, Scripture defends itself. When he pulled that out, on, when he pulled the Scripture out on the devil, the devil was done. Scripture fights its own war. Listen, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes it. It's true with the word of God. It's alive, powerful, sharper, the two-edged sword, piercing, dividing the soul, the son of the spirit. Yeah, 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 come on. Right? I mean, that's the power. It's a critic, critic and judge of the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Lay that sucker out on him. Let him fight your fight. That's what I say. That's what I'm learning from them. That's exactly what I'm learning from them. Here's their attitude like concrete, all mixed up, purpose set. We are convinced that you are not who you pretend to be. We think that you're just this kind of a guy who represents yourself in a certain way to others to get them to give you money or something. Who knows what, right? You know why they think that way? Listen, you know why they do that? We used to call that calling the kettle. That's what we used to call it, right? 
we can't do that anymore, but we used to do that. And we used to know what that meant. Right? You know why they do that? Because that's what they do. They think that's how everybody does. You know, when people accuse you of things, where do they get that from? Where did you come up with that? When there are no facts to it, where did that come from? It came from the cesspool inside. That's where it came from. They say we consider this to be blasphemous. We think that's blasphemous to think it, let alone say it. What, listen, Jesus said in verse 12, I'm the light of the world. Men walk in darkness. No more. Come out of the shadows. Come out of the shadows and walk in the light. Walk in the light. Everybody walks in darkness. Come walk in the light with me. I am the light of the world. Come walk with me. Walk in light instead of darkness. We spend so much time in darkness. It's hard to get rid of it when you come to the light. You know that? We go back to our old ways. But listen, isn't he patient with us? Isn't he patient with us? Listen, he's a light no matter what you view. He's always a light. He's always a light. I don't care. You're always walking, flip-flopping. That's okay. He said, that's okay. Baby. That's okay. I am the light. Come home. Come home to daddy. Come home. I'm always the light. The light's always on. The light's always on. Come on home. Light's always on. Isn't that good that we have a, such a savior? That we bounce all over the place. Listen, it's okay. Come on home. I am the light. You don't have to walk in darkness and depression and all that moodiness. You don't have to do that. I understand you do it, but you don't have to. Come on home. Walk in the light. Don't walk in the darkness of your soul. Don't do that. Come on home. Walk in light. It's a choice. It's a choice. I didn't turn no light off. Why are you in darkness? I didn't turn all the light off. I am the light of the world. In verse 32, he told them that my disciples know the truth and that truth will set them free. There's not a person in this room here today that doesn't know somebody in bondage. Of some sort. Agreed? It could be emotional. It could be alcohol, drugs, pornography. It could be a thousand and one things. Right? You want to be free? You've got to face the truth. We'd go down to these rehabbing places. Mr. Farmer and I, he dragged me along. We'd tell them the absolute truth. Tell them, you want to be free? They accept the truth. The truth will set you free. And if you don't accept the truth, you'll always reign in bondage. And these guys... Would go from rehab to rehab to rehab to rehab, rehab. All they did was just keep retreading. Same old tire, same old tire, same old tire, just retread. Same old tire, just retread. How about a new one? The old one working? That's one of Al's lines. The, is the old way working? Maybe we ought to try another one. What do you think? Let me tell you, you cannot get out of bondage apart from believing the truth. He said it's the truth that sets you free. And you know what your bondage is? A lie. A lie from the devil. A lie from the world. A lie from your flesh. That's the three enemies. 
right? In 1 John 2, the world, the flesh, and the, you know. In verse, verse 51 and 2, he tells them, you'll never die. <laughs> you'll never die. And they went, Abraham died. All the prophets died. You say it won't die. No, I mean, I will remove you from death. You know what he means? I will remove you from death. I will remove you from death where death is no longer a hold on you. No more sin. No more death. None of it. It's been, you have been freed from it. I destroy sin. I destroy death. You can be free from death. It's not a bondage. 